I was having y'all, but Rico from Street Scores, as you can see, I am not home with my normal setup. And I missed making a video yesterday. I haven't gone a day without making a video in weeks, maybe even a couple of months. I don't know, but I'm back at it. Even though I'm on vacation, we still got to come with those videos. And I promise y'all a video of the day outside of yesterday. But the Washington Commanders have now signed quarterback Jeff Driscoll and Jeremy McNichols, the running back. And of course, took a little bit of time to watch some film on them. There's not a lot of film out there to get, but I watched as much as I could. And first of all, my, my immediate thought, I'm not gonna lie, both of those names sounds like the two main characters from a Western movie, dog. Like, they literally sound like they're straight out of Tombstone. You got Wyatt Earp, my favorite character, Doc Holliday. Now we got Jeff Driscoll and Jeremy McNichols. I mean, they right with them. You can put the accent on it and everything. But even outside of how fun their names are, are either of these signings noteworthy? Do any of them have any potential to positively impact the commanders in 2024, especially like the regular season, not just the preseason, not training camp, but do any of these guys have any potential to bring us anything positive in the regular season? Or are both of these guys just camp bodies and guys that are just gonna stick around, maybe not even make the 53 man roster. We're gonna dive into all that and more, but before we do, make sure you still follow that like button, still follow the subscription button, still follow the bell next to that subscription button so you get notification each and every time I release an informative and opinionated video just like this one. Also, while I'm gone too, I'm gonna try to get as many different angles when I record these videos as possible too. You know what I'm saying? Gotta have a little bit of fun with it. Gotta change the background up as much as I can. Um, try to different rooms, different areas, stuff like that. But yeah, man, make sure you stay tuned because I'm coming to y'all with so much content, even though I'm not home. The only thing with me not being home, I can't do film sessions, but everything outside of that, we can still get to those. So make sure you stay tuned. Without further ado, let's go ahead and get to this video right now. Let's get it. Adam, Adam. All right, so let's start with the quarterback signing. Washington has now signed veteran quarterback Jeff Driscoll. Jeff Driscoll, got to put a little accent on it. 30 years old, was a sixth round pick by the San Francisco 49ers in 2016 before Adam Peters got there. Let's note that. And then he's also played for seven teams over the span of his career so far. He started 12 games so far in his career and his stats are not good. Let's go ahead and get that out the way. The stats are not good at all. But Adam Peters did say that he wanted four quarterbacks on roster. He literally said it like way back when. The exact quote is, quote, I hate to sound like a broken record here, but we're gonna do whatever we think is best for the team. So whether that's any of those different options, I mean, we have two quarterbacks on the roster right now with Jake Fromm and Marcus Mariota. So you wanna go to camp with four. So we're gonna add two more one way or another. So however that happens, that's what we're gonna do. So now we have our third guy. Of course, the fourth guy is gonna come in the draft. By far the most likely number two overall, but we'll see what happens there. But now we have three of the four quarterbacks that they wanna go into training camp with. Again, Marcus Mariota, Jake Fromm. Now you got your boy, Jeff Driscoll. I keep trying to put the accent on it. Um, former Lions teammate with David Blah, who is now our assistant quarterbacks coach. And that was under Lance Newmark, who is now our assistant general manager under Adam Peters. He was also at Florida with Dan Quinn, so there's the connection. And oh, of course, let me stop where I'm at because you already know Resh Manuel was the guy that's providing this information right here. Shouts out to Resh Manuel per usual. Make sure you follow him on Twitter if you want any of these background information, crazy connections, did you know facts, all of that, man. Resh Manuel is your guy. So continuing on, even outside of the David Blah, Lance Newmark, and Dan Quinn connections, he also pointed out the fact that hopefully Washington doesn't need Driscoll to start, but if he does, he joined the following players who have started for both the Washington Commanders and the Cleveland Browns. You have Rip, Campbell, RG3, Colt McCoy, Case Keenum, and Jacoby Brissett. That's really interesting. Again, hopefully we never have to see that guy touch the field, and I'm about to explain why. Well, first of all, Chris Cooley um, provided a funny meme. Here's that if you want to see it. And technically, that's true right now. Like, right now, quarterback one is up for grabs. Of course, with the draft in less than a month away, it's going to be whoever we end up taking number two overall, and we're going to dive into why it's already. I'm assuming that the guy that we take a number two overall is starting week one for us because I don't feel like either of those guys I can trust enough to go out there in week one. Even with Fromm having the preseason that he had last year, 
I just don't like any of these guys potentially having to step in week one of the regular season for us for, for however long it may take if we take like a developmental high ceiling, low floor, boom or bust type of guy, quarterback number two overall. But as of right now, technically today, Marcus Mariota, Jake Fromm, and Jeff Driscoll are fighting for quarterback one right now, but we know that that will not last long. So now when it comes to Jeff Driscoll specifically, is he assumed to be quarterback three? Just after Jake Fromm, and again, let me just go ahead and put quarterback taking it number two at one. Then you have Marcus Mariota two, then maybe it's Jeff Driscoll, then maybe Jake Fromm. Just off of the fact that Jake Fromm has never started an NFL game in his career. And again, Jeff Driscoll has 12. And then Marcus Mariota, not good either, but he's the former number two overall pick. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, I'm assuming that like in a game, because now they changed the rules and everything too, to where you can have unlimited quarterbacks like this available for a game day. So if one guy gets hurt, you can go to the second guy. Second guy gets hurt, you can go to the third. And after the third guy gets hurt, you can go to the fourth, I believe. So they're going to carry all of these guys. And it doesn't affect your 53-man roster or your active roster that you're allowed to take into a game. So they're going to carry all of these guys. I'm assuming it's whoever we take at number two that's going out there starting week one immediately. Get him going, even if he's still a little bit raw in a few areas. None of these quarterbacks scream. We're good to go. That guy, one of those three guys can start until the rookie is ready. None of those guys show that, in my opinion, at all. But we'll see how this goes as far as the whole situation with this quarterback group. But again, assuming like week one, we get a guy that's ready to start week one. I think Marcus Mariota is your direct backup. But again, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter because we can carry all four guys. It's not like a couple of years ago and pretty much all throughout NFL history before then that you had your one quarterback, maybe you take two, and then it's highly unlikely, but maybe you keep three. Now we can have unlimited, so it's kind of like, why not have four going into game days? But we'll see how that goes. Again, as of right now, I have number two pick, Marcus Mariota, Jeff Driscoll, and then Jake Fromm at the very bottom, me personally. But again, like I just said, none of these quarterbacks scream dependable starter that can play until rookie quarterback is ready. So this signing, nor this overall quarterback room that we currently have between those three guys that's already here, give you the freedom to draft a super developmental type of guy, a super project type of guy. But that's if, that's only if, you only feel that way if you think that the commanders are going to try to be competitive in year one of this rebuild, AKA recalibration. Because just let me know, man. Do we not care about winning games in 2024? I highly doubt that they sacrifice future success for immediate winning, for immediate gain. I'm not saying that at all, but also by our free agency moves, I highly doubt that they're gonna be okay with just winning like five or less games this season. They've put in way too much time. They've gone out and signed too many guys that can plug in holes to where we don't have any real glaring weaknesses outside of the quarterback position and left tackle right now for us to just go into this season just assuming it's just a a long, long lost season before we even started and we're just going in there. Hopefully we maybe win three games. I don't think they're going in there with that mentality. And again, none of these quarterbacks that we currently have, even at the sign of Jeff Driscoll, that they're already on the roster screen, they can win you a regular season game right now. I feel like even if you took all of their best traits from each of those three guys and then like Voltron them, I would still have no faith in any of these guys winning a regular season game. So I'm just assuming, I'm saying all of that to say that I'm assuming that the rookie quarterback that we're going to take and that's going to start week one for us um, is going to have to have some type of floor. Like he's, if, if we're assuming that the rookie quarterback is going to come in and win us at least six games based off of what they've done in free agency and they clearly want to win now-ish. I'm not saying they're in a win-now mode. Again, I don't think they're going to mortgage the future for instant success, but they're definitely not trying to go into this season only winning like three or four games. So then I'm assuming that whichever quarterback we take is going to maybe be, be the most day one ready. Especially like if Caleb Williams more than likely going number one overall after that, who's the most day one ready quarterback? And even though I see what people mean when they say that May has like the highest ceiling potentially, even though I would say Jaden Daniels is ceiling, it's right there with him having the best deep ball and having the extreme mobility that he has. But I can see what people see in like Drake May's arm ceiling, maybe not overall ceiling, but arm ceiling especially. But I would also add that he would has a higher floor than what people give him credit for, especially with his experience changing protections at the line of scrimmage, going through progressions, like all of the quarterback nuance things like that. But 
At the end of the day, Jaden Daniels is still easily the more day one ready quarterback, point blank period. Definitely over a Drake May, I feel like easily. I feel like if anything, May is the least day one ready out of the top at least three consensus quarterbacks. You could argue even maybe going further down than that that he's less day one ready than a lot of the other guys. Because Jaden does all of those things that I just said that Drake May does with changing protections at the line, going through progressions and things like that. But he's also far more consistent with open, hitting open receivers because Drake May will miss a guy that's wide open for absolutely no reason. And I feel like that would give Cliff Kingsbury a panic attack if they tried to start on day one. I'm not saying that Drake May can't be taught and coached up to not do that anymore. I feel like it's definitely a big mechanical issue, but Jaden Daniels doesn't have those mechanical issues. He has the quicker, more compact release with less wasted motion, all of that type of stuff. And I just feel like if you needed a quarterback out, especially after Caleb Williams goes one, you need a quarterback that you can for sure know that is gonna hit this seven yard slant route that's wide open for a first down. Who do you depend on the most? I would argue that it's probably Jaden Daniels. And then on top of that, he has the best deep ball out of any quarterback in this entire class as of today. Of course, with like arm strength and arm talent, you could argue that Drake May and Caleb Williams have a higher ceiling when it comes to deep ball. But as far as what we've seen so far through tape, what they've done in college, Jaden Daniels was the best deep ball thrower in college football last year. I feel like it's honestly only between him and Michael Penix when you're looking at the eye test. But the reason I go with Jaden Daniels is because he smoked everybody else statistically when it comes to the best deep ball and then on top of that Jaden Daniels is also specifically the best slot fade thrower out of this entire draft as well and players and coaches always talk about how that's literally the hardest route to cover in all of football like the entire sport itself that's the hardest route to cover and Jaden Daniels is elite and consistent at it for some odd reason that's just so random to be really good at something that difficult I feel like if he can become that great at something that difficult, that also shows his work ethic to where whatever else you need him to get better at, he can take the time and put in the work effort, the extra study time in the film booth, the extra throws after practice, even outside of like the allotted um, practice time and things. He's gonna do. He's gonna do whatever it takes to make sure he improves just off of that. But even if he doesn't, again, he's elite and consistent at some of the most difficult things to be elite and consistent at, most notably that slot fade throw. I mean, it's ridiculous. That takes incredible touch. And of course, mobility is also a floor raiser as well. When we're talking about Jaden Daniels' floor, it's something that a young quarterback can always use to at the very least, even if they don't win games, to keep games close and interesting while they're still learning how to be a nuanced quarterback, to gain all of the mental stuff, accuracy, going through progressions and things like that. And Jaden has the best legs in this draft easily. Now, you could argue as of today, he's not the most mobile in the pocket, especially in my opinion, compared to the other two guys like Drake May and Caleb Williams. I feel like their movement in the pocket is a little bit better than Jaden Daniels, but that doesn't mean that Jaden Daniels isn't still great. I just feel like they're just even better. But when it comes to outside of the pocket, Jaden Daniels is obviously by far the most mobile and dynamic out of this entire quarterback class. And, and even if we want to talk about day one ready ability from a different point of view, Jaden Daniels' traits are the most similar to Kyler Murray's probably out of anybody in this draft class, even like a Caleb Williams, who won with his legs and his deep ball more than anything else. So we're talking traits wise, Jaden Daniels is the closest thing to what are what were Kyler Murray's strengths? How did he win most often? That's what Jaden Daniels does as well. So even just from the Cliff Kingsbury side of things, it would be easier and quicker to develop the best offensive scheme and offense around a Jaden Daniels than a Drake May. Now I do think that Drake May developing an offense around him to bring out his strengths, hide his weaknesses would also be easy and quick as well. I don't feel like either of these quarterbacks are the wrong answer. We're just here to debate about who's the right answer. And right now, specifically, day one ready. And Drake May was in the air raid system, which is technically the core of what Cliff Kingsbury runs. But Jaden is literally is about as close as you can get to Kyler Murray, in my opinion. I mean, he's so close that Cliff Kingsbury could literally just go deep into his storage closet somewhere, go into his old playbooks, dust off the Kyler Murray one, and we could just go ahead and work from there. Maybe add a little tweaks here and there if you want to, but he could literally pick up the Kyler Murray playbook with his name all over it and everything, and we could work just from that alone. Also, like I broke down in another video in greater detail, I feel like the fact that Jaden Daniels had elite and fast receivers, if anything, actually helps his evaluation. Because I can see the argument that, yeah, like the tight window throws, like when he gets to the NFL, 
people aren't gonna be as open and things like that. There's gonna be better coverage, but first of all, he's a great tight window thrower, even with the great receivers that he had, because again, another debate that always comes up, the point that I always bring up is that, yeah, he had great receivers, but he was also going against better defenses. So Drake may had the worst offense around him, but he also wasn't going against Alabama and Ole Miss and these great defenses in the SEC and things like that. I feel like at the end of, at the, end of the day, it technically almost cancels out, but at the end of the day, Jaden Daniels did have more time in the pocket than a Drake made. But at the same time, Jaden Daniels had to deal with the Alabama defense. Who even Logan Paulson himself said that Alabama's defense schematically is harder to read and adjust to. And as far as coverages to understand what's going on pre and post snap, than even most NFL defenses like Alabama runs one of the most complicated defenses. And Jaden Daniels killed them until he got knocked out for the game. And that's a whole nother argument. But again, going back to the elite cast of receivers that he had for him, I feel like if anything, Secondly, that's an advantage for him because Terry and Jahan are great, fast, and quick receivers. And young quarterbacks usually struggle with timing and ball placement with throwing to fast receivers at the NFL level because it's completely different. Like, you need to throw it harder. You need to throw it faster. You need to throw it further ahead. Like, if they're running a slant or something like that to maximize yak yardage and things like that. Or to be able to just hit a receiver deep down the field in stride, like way, way down the field and things like that. And Jaden already has an entire year minimum of doing that over and over again. And out of all of the top quarterbacks, I feel like Jaden would be the least likely to keep underthrowing Terry McLaurin and De'Ami Brown and the other fast receivers when he like first gets out of the league. Of course, maybe three, four years down the line, maybe again with Caleb Williams and Drake May's arm talent and ridiculous arm strength, they do have more of that than Jaden Daniels. So maybe down the line they become better, but I know for a fact when we're discussing day one ready, Jaden Daniels is easily my best bet to be able to hit Terry McLaurin and Yami Brown in stride to not underthrow them, to not force them to slow down or like, I mean, like if they're running a really fast slant route and if you throw it behind them to force them to like adjust it, they're running this way. They got to turn around and adjust their body and reach behind them to get the ball. And then they got to slow down to get it. They're going to get killed by the guy coming. But if they're able to keep running in full speed, maybe the guy takes a bad angle, they catch it. They can keep going for 30 yards rather than basically getting completely just obliterated from behind like straight through their back and and now it now it looks like a hospital ball almost so Jaden Daniels already has a load of experience throwing to NFL receivers I know a lot of people say that the fact that Jaden Daniels had NFL receivers they feel like it hurts his evaluation I feel like if anything it helps it because when they go to the NFL they're gonna throw to receivers that are NFL receivers they're gonna throw to receivers that are really fast that can get open that they need you to place the ball in a specific way that maximizes their yak yardage. And Jaden Daniels has the most experience out of doing that out of probably any of the other quarterbacks in this entire class, but especially over like a guy like Drake May. Again, we're going through this whole scenario, assuming Caleb Williams goes number one overall. Who's the most day one ready based on the way that this quarterback room looks? I'm going to assume that it's Jaden Daniels, but maybe... Again, like I talked about before we even started talking about Jaden Daniels versus Drake May as far as day one ready, maybe they don't care about that. Maybe they're willing to just take the guy who has the assumed by a lot of people, Drake May has the higher ceiling. Maybe they're willing to just wait that out. Maybe it takes two, three, four years for him to get it, but maybe they prefer to do that rather than to try to win immediately. We'll see. Now, moving on, the commanders also announced that they signed running back Jeremy McNichols. Yes, sir. With the 49ers off and on last season and this is coming straight from scott jennings of hogs haven so shouts out to him because i'm gonna read a lot of what he said about him just to do like a quick rundown because i completely agree i mean i felt like he just summed it up perfectly so we're just gonna go with my dog scott jennings said over there so make sure you shout out him the washington commander's new front office continues to run a tight ship during general manager Adam Peters' first offseason with the team, most of the news of signings has come directly from the team. No leaks, no nothing. Like, they are not playing. Most of the news has come directly from the team, and today's signing of running back Jeremy McNichols continues that trend. This is not a high-profile signing, and McNichols is definitely not guaranteed to make the team. Let's just go ahead and get that out the way. But again, I do want to emphasize the fact that this did not get leaked in any way from like a reporter or anybody close to the commanders or nothing. The first time anybody knew that this guy was signed as far as like the fan base or any reporters knew it was literally directly from the commander's twitter account themselves with a whole graphic made up and everything i mean they are on it this is definitely a tight ship that adam peters is running i mean 
we shouldn't be so excited about this. This should be the norm, but hey, man, we're not used to having grown men and professionals running our team, and it's, it's nice to finally catch up to the rest of the league, to at least most of the rest of the league um, as far as that goes. Jeremy McNichols was a fifth-round pick by the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in 2017. He was released before the season started and signed to the San Francisco 49ers practice squad. This was Adam Peters' first year with the team and his first as vice president of player personnel, a role he held for four years until he was promoted to assistant GM. McNichols didn't play a snap on offense during his rookie season, but did play 43% of special teams snaps. So he's basically like a special teams guy. McNichols was waived by the 49ers the following year. They spent some time on the practice squads or rosters of five other teams over the next three seasons. So he was bouncing around, just kind of just signed here, waved there, signed here, waved there, things like that. He would end up returning to the Titans, who had signed him from the Broncos practice squad back in 2018. And then he earned a roster spot with it. When he spun back on the Titans, he finally made the most of it. And he actually ended up playing quite a few games for them. He had his best two seasons in the NFL with the Tennessee Titans, the 2020 season and the 2021 season, where he rushed for a total of 360 yards and one touchdown and had 295 receiving yards total and another touchdown through the air. And McNichols drifted to the Falcons during the 2022 offseason and then signed with the Steelers where his season ended on the injured reserve, sadly. And then he returned to the 49ers last season where he played 27% of special team snaps. So this is a guy that... He doesn't even play very often on special teams either. At the very least, most recently, this is not a guy that you really expect to play often anywhere. Running back, special teams, whatever. He's just, you know, I guess you can kind of say he's a camp body. But when you go back to his 2020 season and his 2021 season, those are the only seasons that he played a double digit amount of games in a season. Like his rookie season from San Francisco, he played two games. And after that, for the Colts, one game. Jaguars, one game. And then most recently, 2023 for the 49ers, only three games. But going back to his time with the Tennessee Titans, he played 16 games in 2020 and 14 games in 2021. And you could kind of project them as like a receiving back because the 2021 season, he had more receiving yards than rushing yards. He had 240 receiving yards and only 156 rushing yards, which is really interesting. And then in his most recent year where he played even just enough snaps for Pro Football Focus to even take the time to grade him again back to this 2021 season that I just spoke about with him having more receiving yards than rushing yards. He even had one game where he had 10 targets, 8 receptions, 74 receiving yards. So he was definitely more of like a receiving back than anything else. He was more of a wide receiver, a small wide receiver than a running back. But in that 2021 season, he had a grade of a 60.4 overall. He had an 83.9 fumble grade. So this is somebody you don't have to necessarily worry about turning the ball over. So, hey, man, that's pretty interesting. I mean, again, this is mostly just a camp body or something like that. He just seems like he's just super deep in the depth chart as like a third down back type of guy. Or he's a camp body. Or maybe he's even a special teams contributor. But at the end of the day, just to let you know, I do not expect him to make the final 53-man roster going into the 2024 season at all. So technically, neither of these signings that we've discussed today are any big news at all, but they do matter. First of all, you never know if something just clicks all of a sudden from one of these guys. You never know. And even with that being highly unlikely, there's still the fact that with all of this depth that we're signing in free agency, it allows us, first of all, we're just trying to get to a 90-man roster that we're allowed to have in the all season before we got to cut it down to 53 before the regular season. But this helps us not be desperate to take any particular position group in the draft other than franchise quarterback number two overall and left tackle as soon as possible after that. After that, we're free to basically take best player available at that point. So yeah, of course, none of these signings today were exciting, but they're also not pointless. I want to emphasize that. Yeah, man, that's the end of this video. Please get in the comment section. Let me know how you feel about everything discussed in this video. Please stiff on that like button. Stiff on the subscription button. Stiff on the bell next to that subscription button so you get a notification each and every time I release an informative and opinionated video just like this one. Again, I'm not home right now, but I'm still coming to y'all with daily videos outside of yesterday. So stay tuned because I'm going to keep y'all updated on a few more things. Like we have some top 30 visits coming in. I got to get y'all updated on some guys that the commanders seem to be very interested in. Again, I'm still working on my cap space update, but we keep signing more people. So I'm like, is it time? Like, is it time to go ahead and do the cap space update? Next thing you know, we signed two guys in the same in the same day. Even though none of these guys are going to be heavy cap hits, I still want to be as accurate as possible. But I may just go ahead and knock that video out, and then we'll just move on from there. But you never know, because I feel like as soon as I do the cap space update video and give y'all where we rank in
I feel like the very next morning we're going to sign Justin Simmons, and which I hope happens. If if I got to go ahead and knock out this cap space video to jinx myself to force us to sign Justin Simmons, then so be it. I'm about to go ahead and get that cap space video done tomorrow if that's the case. But yeah, man, make sure y'all let me know in the comment section how you feel about these signings. Are you as low on these signings as I am where I feel like literally the only reason Jeff Driscoll is going to make the roster is because of the new NFL rule where you can have pretty much as many backup quarterbacks as you want to have. And then the I highly doubt that Jeremy McNichols makes the roster, even though I love both of their names sounding like two characters from Tombstone, but I doubt any of these guys are going to make the roster. So let me know how you feel about, well, Jeremy McNichols. Again, Jeff Driscoll is going to make it just by default because it's kind of like, why not? But let me know how you feel about everything discussed in this video. Let me know how you feel about these signings. I'm going to catch y'all later. Appreciate y'all. I'm out.